Okay, so um, on the call this evening, uh, I'm really grateful for various contributions and I know there are some people ready to contribute to the conversation that might not be actually speaking this evening and grateful to them as well for coming on tonight. But um, we do have contributions from Miriam Munjothi, from Fionn Edgley, from Ashley Rus Russell Cowan, from Paula Langton and Philip Watson and from Lydia Lee. And then also just to introduce ourselves, I'm Helen Smedley and I've also got Gail Pink on the call. Um, so if you want to say hello, Gail. Uh, hi everyone, looking forward to uh, the discussions tonight. That's brilliant. Okay, so tonight's format is going to be, um, as I say, we'll start with the presentations. Uh, I've got some information to share with you and some ideas, some experiences. Feel free to use the chat box during that time while you're on mute. Um, and we may ask you to come off mute to speak. And as I say, cameras are optional, but really nice to see a face to the name. So we're going to start by considering the current situation in the UK and then have a look in more detail in the Archery GB statistics. We're going to be looking at uh, a few experiences from people on the call who may be sharing their top tips for engaging women and girls in archery. We're hoping to point you to some resources and some ideas and end with an, a, a good amount of time for an open discussion later this evening. So to start with the current situation, so what do we know? Um, so as you can see, the picture in terms of getting women active is, um, is one where we need to address the balance. Far fewer women are active than men. Um, almost at every age group that is uh, the case in the UK. Um, but women do want to do more sport and physical activity. So as we can see there, four in 10 women in the UK aged over 16 are not active enough to ensure they get the full benefits, uh, health benefits from sport and physical activity. And the reasons for that are uh, complex in some cases, but they're to do with family pressures, staying in maybe around children's bedtimes, meal times, maybe work schedules, so a variety of reasons. So this is from the Sport England data. Apologies if you are not in England, but the picture will be very similar across the whole of the country. So why? Some of the barriers, some of the research shows that there's a mix of practical barriers and emotional pressures that prevent women from being as active as they would like. So we could have feelings, feeling bad about being away from the family or spending that time on themselves. The cost of taking part in sport and physical activity, particularly if they're prioritising their families or household budget. It could be pressure on their time. However, you do also find that busy women are actually more active. So um, there's a balance there between some feeling they haven't got enough time and others seeming to squeeze it all in. So finding the right activity at the right time when they're available sometimes is a barrier. And sometimes it is about lack of information, especially if they are then compounded by uh, that lack of time to find the information to actually invest in finding out what's available when they're free. Emotionally, women could be fearful about uh, judgment, might be around appearance, general unhappiness, uh, fear of not looking feminine, as well as being put off by what you look like when you're actually doing the activity. It could be about social confidence, put off by the idea of having to confront these activities on their own or that they won't fit in. It could be concerns around ability. So it could be around a, an injury or a health condition or just fears that you're not going to come up to live up to the level, the standard of everyone else or even of the, the in their own minds. Even women that were previously sporty um, that might be coming back into activity can worry about their ability. Um, so that also can become a barrier. 
Okay, I'm going to hand over to Gail. Hopefully everyone's heard about this girl campaign, which is funded by the National Lottery and it's delivered and developed by Sport England. Um, it's, they've done a lot of insight and research into what would get females uh, doing sports. And uh, I think, as Helen said, it's not about looking perfect in, in, in Lycra. And I think the bit I like about from the campaign was someone said, I, I do sport because I love my body rather than I hate my body. So they appreciate the, the physical benefits of, of doing archery, uh, sorry, of doing sport. Also to let you know that um, there is a website dedicated to this girl, CAN, and they've got a whole suite of resources that are free. So we will share the uh, link to the uh, This Girl Can website. And also to let you know that um, our Google Analytics um, show that on average, um, Archery GB website receives 50 hits per month from This Girl Can website. So people are interested in archery and we will be developing a specific landing page for, for encouraging women into to archery. Uh, next slide, please, Helen. Just to give you some sort of national statistics around Archery GB membership. So in the past, Archery has been very male dominated, but it's good to know that the balance is a bit more even. I think it's really interesting that under 18, the uh, ratio is, is pretty even. So um, sort of in 2019 membership year, 60% were male and 40% female, whereas in uh, 2020 membership year it was 56% male and 44% female at under 18 but the older you get the greater the divide so over 18 in sort of 2019 membership year there was 76% male and 24% female whereas in 2020 membership year 73% uh, um, male and 27% female this also correlates that 40% um, of those leaving archery within 18 months are, are female. So lots of our female members are short stay. Next slide, please. Um, archery GB has done some insight into the barriers to taking part and retaining participation in archery. Uh, this isn't female specific, but I think it's still relevant. So the top three barriers are availability of facilities, access to suitable coaching and cost of equipment. Um, the black line is our sort of casual shooters. Uh, and so that is the, the second biggest barrier to, to new people coming into the, the, the sport. And then on the, the next slide, a couple of our, <laughs> I'm a speedy presenter, I'm afraid, Helen. <laughs> That's good. Uh, um, some of our um, key volunteer groups have tried to drill down to what are the specific barriers to increasing female participation in, in archery. And these are the, some of the ideas they've come up with. So childcare specifically for maybe females around sort of 25 to 35 years. Uh, personal barriers, as Helen, you highlighted earlier, maybe lack of confidence or exam pressures for some of our, our fem younger females, lack of role models of judges, coaches, tournament organisers and fellow archers. The critical mass of women and girls currently involved in, in archery. I think if you, uh, for example, attend a beginner's course but you might be the only female that that might put you off from continuing i, I do think that um having to do a beginner's course is a really positive <laughs> thing for the the sport that you could get a critical mass of uh you know six or, or 12 females doing a beginner's course and hopefully they can support each other all the way through the the club so it can be seen as a benefit um, also, archery doesn't appeal visually as often seen as more elite competitive. I suppose people might only see it in the Olympics and, and Paralympics. 
uh, the balance between participating in the sport for fun and then the introduction of, of technique and talent requirements might put some of our younger archers off. And then maybe the perception that the sport has a bit of an old boys club presence and is predominantly sort of strength based. I really think we need to do more to really highlight the benefits of, of archery for, for different audiences. And then the next slide, please, Helen. Uh, this is also sort of reflected in our archery volunteers. So we said that role models are, are really important. We did a volunteer survey back at the end of 2018. Now, I don't know where the, the time's gone. We've just sort of lost a, a year. But um, the percentage of female volunteers was 27 percent compared to males, which was 70 percent. So that sort of correlates with our uh, overall male female split of, of membership. But a real positive is that our ambassador and mentor program actually has a 50-50 split between male and, and female. And uh, at the younger level, there are sort of six male compared to 11 female and our student ambassadors, one male compared to four females. So it's fantastic having those uh, female ambassadors for the sport. And we've got two on the call tonight. So, uh, yeah, thank you for them for all the work that they, they do. And then the next slide. Uh, Archery GB does have a sort of uh, a female only initiative called Project Ramaya. Ramaya is Arabic for the word archery and it's a sports aid funded initiative. Uh, it's sort of a bit of a participation and a sort of pathway initiative. Um, the aim is to increase participation of archery in ethnically diverse communities to try and, and make our sports sort of more, more diverse. And there's a particular focus on engaging um, Muslim women and, and girls. We know that archery has a particular strong cultural significance in Islam, that it's one of the three sort of sports that are promoted by the Prophet. So it's archery, swimming and, and horse riding. So we have targeted um, faith schools, um, delivered some uh, school archery activities sort of after school activity. There's some intra and inter school competition, uh, focus on the training of, of coaches and, and volunteers. But the long term aim is to establish community clubs. Um, we've learned a lot from Project Ramai. It's sort of been delivered for a, a, a couple of, of years now. So we're now um, trying to focus more on sort of partnership working to establish those um, sustainable community clubs. It was predominantly sort of delivered in the West Midlands and now we're um, reaching out further afield and we've got some good partnership with Inspiring Grace and the hub in the, the Sheffield North area and the Muslaha Sports Association and Barking Rugby Club. So that will be a three way of partnership. So they're based in Essex and also um, the identification of, of role models. So we have uh, advocates sort of within that community to promote archery. And we have uh, an example from Sharifa on the next slide. So uh, Sharifa Adam, um, she is one of our sort of uh, trialing a community ambassador uh, approach. Um, she's an instructor and got in contact with, with Helen and now she actually sits on our strategic ad advisory group and um, she's promoting archery in Huddersfield and, and her role is to increase opportunities to try archery, to try and get sustainable archery going. So she sort of speaks to her local mosque and she's got some archery sessions delivered at her, her mosque. And uh, she's also establishing relationships with local schools as well. So she is such a positive role model for the sports and also providing vital insight to, to Archery GB in how we can um, encourage stronger links with the sort of Muslim community. And um, 
Yeah, this is a slide from Sport England's Active Lives survey, which reveals that there's um, a significant difference in the physical activity levels of adults from different ethnic backgrounds. So I just wanted to highlight, obviously, there's a difference in participation between male and female, but that difference is even larger in um, ethnic diverse communities. And then there's another slide which I've stolen um, from Women in Sports. And this, uh, they've developed a resource specifically around engaging Muslim women. So this sort of highlights that um, the barriers facing British Muslim women might be very similar to non-Muslim women. Um, but a Muslim women um, ideally want sort of a female only session in a, an environment where no one else can see them. And archery has so many benefits that you can pretty much wear what you want for archery. So that is fantastic for this particular um, priority group. And there's just some sort of statistics around health, um, that Muslim women's health in, in later life is not as good overall and the visibility of um, the sport as, as well. And then this seems like an ideal opportunity to bring Miriam into conversation. So uh, Miriam is one of our ambassadors and we're also using Miriam as a role model for, for Project Ramaya. Um, she's based at Leicester Archery Academy. And Miriam, could you just explain sort of your journey into and, and through archery? Yeah, sure. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, brilliant. Okay, that's good. Um, so yeah, hi, I'm Mariam. Um, I started archery properly for my bronze Duke of Edinburgh award. So that was in year nine. Um, I'm in year 12 at the moment. And I took archery on because I thought, so I am a Muslim and I know it's promoted highly that archery is a sunnah sport. So it's it's meant to be have loads of different virtues for you to do so I thought why not try it and I did it for six months um as part of my bronze award but I had already been shooting beforehand but not properly just like in my garden with my dad um but from doing the Duke of Edinburgh I really enjoyed it so I continued with archery and like had like Gail had said, mentioned earlier um, so at Leicester Archie Academy, they have female only sessions and then male only sessions. And then you have like a mixed development group. And what this is, is so I did my beginners course in the female only session because we had female instructors. And it was very different because because it's a predominantly Muslim group, everyone was able to take their scarf off and everything. So they didn't need to worry about the men around them or anything. So that was um, one of the highlights. Well, not for me, because I don't wear a scarf, but I know for my friends who do. Um, but I then continued on with archery for my Silver Duke of Edinburgh Award in year 10. And then I started doing some competitions. And when I started progressing in archery, Muhammad, who's one of the mentors for AGB as well, he put he gave me the idea to sign up for the ambassador program, which I did and I was successful in doing. Um, but yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And that's how I got into archery. So yeah. Uh, what are your future aspirations for archery, Miriam? With archery? See, archery is very much one of those sports where you can take part and you can compete and you can do it just for fun but at the same time if you want to progress there are those routes to do so so at the moment although I am competing well not right now because of COVID but I am competing but it depends on where I get through that because at the moment I'm part of the Leicestershire and Rutland's Junior Development Squad for Excellent Individuals. We, we call it Jedi, I have to sometimes remember what it's called. Um, but because I'm part of that, we get training to hopefully be selected for the county team. And I haven't been able to attend any of those trials because of this virus, but hopefully I'm 
aiming to be on there. But if not, archery is still a fun sport and I've still got a lot of school work and everything that I can balance with it. Right. Thank you, Miriam. Uh, what would be your top tip to in engaging females in, in archery? When I first joined archery, I know so a lot of the boys I know are very competitive and I'm a very competitive person. But if you don't necessarily do as well, I know that sometimes guys are a bit more well, or oh, you're a girl, you're not necessarily as good as it. This is a guy sport. I mean, guns, shooting, anything with arrows or bullets, they're always like, yeah, it's a guy sort of thing. So I think to, to start with, getting into the sport was easier as it being a women's only session because it's not it's not to do you don't have feel the pressure of being judged by not necessarily just the boys but girls can judge you as well but I, I mean not necessarily feeling the pressure from wanting to not let down the female sort of gender so I female, don't know if that made sense. <laughs> no, no, it did. So female only sessions are sort of really important yeah. in starting off. And then once you're established, you feel confident yeah. in, in mixing with with in a male environment. Is, is having a female coach? That's what, so that no, that's what I did. So I started off with female only environment. And then for my development, I entered, I didn't enter, I joined the male and female session. So that's when I was improving and I have a male coach at the moment. But once I had that confidence already, I felt fine. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Miriam. And, and there might be some oh. questions towards the, the end, if, if that's OK. Yes. Thank you very much for your for your help. Thank you. And um, now um, I'd like to hand over to Fiona, who's another one of our, our student ambassadors. So thank you, Fiona. Hello. I'm going to first apologise for my internet. I am in student accommodation right now, so it might drop out at some point. Um, I actually started archery back in 2012. I did a beginner's course at my local archery club, and I actually stopped attending the archery club after that course because I was the only female of my age at the club. And so I didn't actually do archery again until I came to university four years ago. And that's where it already started. Um, when I came to the club four years ago, there was a handful of females, maybe one in committee, um, and it was predominantly uh, men. Um, so in my second year, I did join committee. I was the only female on the committee. Um, and I also started to become a coach. Um, so there were no female coaches prior to this. And then um, during that year, I was secretary of the archery club. Um, and we got involved in the This Girl Can campaign. So we held a female only taste the session uh, near Christmas, which had a really great turnout. And we invited societies like a question, which was predominantly female. Um, and also we had a lot of interest from courses like game art, which may be predominantly male, but they did have quite a strong female uh, group in them. So that turned out really well, and we retained a lot of females after our beginners course that year. Um, and then in my second year, we actually achieved a 50-50 split of females in the archery club, which was something that we hadn't achieved before. We also had a 50-50 split of committee, um, which is a huge jump. And we also um, continued doing our work with This Girl Can. So I think by having that work, um, by bringing in females and having female uh, icons in the club that really helped to inspire confidence in beginners especially the females um, who are just sort of starting out and especially since we recruit a lot of our new members as freshers so they're all a bit unsure anyway and they're looking for ways to uh, sort of have fun and meet more people so it's really important as a university club that we sort of cater to everyone um, and look out for sort of the girls a bit more because <laughs> they uh, they uh, tend to they tend to want more uh, support and sort of yeah you can do this um, and it's definitely uh, something important to to see another female sort of in the committee position volunteering doing the coaching and getting involved. 
That's great, Fionn. Thanks. Um, that's such a great achievement to have achieved sort of that 50-50 split in the club. And um, it might well be that later when we get to the discussion, we want to talk about how do we how do we not just attract females into the sport, but as you say, continue to offer that support that keeps them in the sport as well. So thanks, Fionn. That's brilliant. So um, I'd like to invite Ashley on to uh, the call now. Uh, so Ashley Rush Russell Cowan is from Bally Valley Arches in Northern Ireland. So welcome, mm -hmm. Ashley. OK, can you hear me all, yeah? Yes, we can. Thank you. Get on. OK, um, well, I'm chairman of Bally Valley Archery Club in Northern Ireland at the moment, and we are a very family oriented club. And in 1920, we had 148 members, of which 45 were female, 45%, sorry, were female. So we've always had a fairly high representation of females in the club. And of those female members, those 45%, we have 52% of those people in the junior age groups. Mm -hmm. So the membership dropped slightly, obviously, over the last year with COVID, but our split of male-female hasn't changed. In fact, it's 50-50. So we've always had a strong female representation in the club. So on our committee, we have um, 20 people and 13 of those are female and seven of them are male. So females do take very much a lead in our club. So I suppose there are a number of things I think we do um, and they've probably been mentioned already, but certainly we mentor and we support females. Um, and I suppose the best way to do this is to give you an example. Um, we had a young 17-year-old who was very interested in coaching. Um, so what we did was we involved her when we were running our coaching sessions. She was able to observe the archers. And then we were able to have a chat with her afterwards to see if she was identifying the right things. So she will probably go ahead and do her coaching course next year. But already she knows that it is something she's really interested in because she's had the opportunity to shadow some of her other coaches. We also had an 18 year old girl who was very keen in starting to do judging. Now, we're very fortunate. We do have um, a number of judges in the club and we also have a youth international judge, Shannon. And um, she mentored, mentored this female and provided her basically with opportunity to ask questions, she took um, her with her as a candidate judge to competitions she was judging at as, as a chair or as a judge. Um, and basically just by encouraging her and facilitating her learning under her wing, she very, very quickly successfully passed her county judge assessment in a very short time. And, and she, she this year, on her own initiative, this young girl, set up all our practice um, outdoors um, sessions for us this year um, didn't have to be asked she used her initiative and it, she's absolutely excellent so really where somebody shows an interest in something we would try to support them to, to try it out to to advance themselves in that area and we always provide a mentor and what we obviously do is make sure it's a female mentor if it's a female looking to advance themselves mm -hmm. the other thing I would say is we Inclusivity is very important. So we would encourage females to play a huge role in running our club, and hence the 13 on the committee. Um, we did run a, a female only a beginners course, just to try to see um, if that would encourage females. We thought they would probably be more comfortable and more relaxed in a group, particularly as females mature. I think they are more conscious about their ability. Now that worked really well and we had 15 people on that beginners course and we had retained them all unfortunately COVID has got in the way because you know they were only new they were doing indoor and, and we've been mainly outdoor in the field since that but again our coaches in the club we five four of them are female one male and um, and they're very young as well we find that you need to have good role models so Three of our coaches are under the age of 25. And I suppose the other thing we do to try and, and include everybody is we, we take care of all abilities. Some people do it for fun. Some people do it to test themselves. And some people do it because they want to move to international level. 
And um, so we would run activities to cater for all. So we run fun shoots. And, and that really is indoors where we have fun faces and targets set out. And when I would be making up the groups for those shoots, I would make sure that if we have new females, that I would make sure I put them on a female group. I would also talk to the females on that group and simply say that there's a new person coming onto their group that night and could they make sure they make them welcome. So there's always a buddying system. You make, I would always make sure that somebody is there to keep chatting to them and make them feel welcome. Because I think if you catch them um, right at the start, even more, a much better chance of keeping them there. And then the last thing I would say, because I don't want to be talking too long, is reward and recognise people. Um, and, and we do celebrate the success of all of our archers, right from our four-year-olds, right up to a gentleman in our club who's 88, and we've had older members in our club. And we just ensure we make a fuss over people who succeed. And that might not be that the minute win a medal. It could be that for them it's an achievement. And we run a prize night. We just had it actually last Friday night. We make sure that kids are recognised and we make sure that females and males are recognised equally. We, we, we make sure of that. Um, and we also have a lot of um, females who come and help with um, all of the work that needs to be done outdoors. We have a static field course. We have a couple of temporary field courses where we, we take our course to it a couple of times a year. And we would have as many females as male helping with that as well. So I suppose in summing up, because I don't want to talk any longer, um, I, I do believe we are a club where we really integrate our females very quickly and ensure that they see the play a key part in the life of our club. Um, and make sure that there's good female role models. You know, as I say, we have three young coaches under 25, with two young judges under 25, one at international level. We have um, three female international archers, and um, you know, we we by, by people with females seeing those females in those positions, they believe they can also strive to achieve that. I think you just need to walk the walk. You know, there's no point in talking about encouraging female participant participation you have to show it so I, I probably would stop there um, because I've talked long enough but in, in my mind you really have to have the female role models integrated in every aspect of your club life and then it becomes a norm and it very much would be the norm in Bala Valley. Mm. Thank you Ashley that's really great that sounds like really empowering uh, and great investment for the future thank you very much. You're very welcome. And so next up, we are going to go to Paula Langton and Philip Watson, both from Peacock Archers and involved at Cambridgeshire level and across their region as well. So uh, Paula and Philip, over Thank to you. you. Thank you, Helen. Can can you hear me OK? Yes, we can. Yeah, I can't, can't see Philip yet. I presume he's he's there and switched on. Yeah, I'm looking in the background. Can you hear me too? Yes, yep. we can. Thanks. Excellent. Um, well, uh, we're from uh, Peacock uh, Archers. We're based in Cambridge. And uh, as you can see from, from our sort of title slide, um, uh, Philip and, and I are coaches. Um, we've qualified to quite a high high level in our on our coaching journey. And um, we just wanted to kind of talk to you today about some things that we've done as a club to help um, encourage women and girls into into our sort of shooting environment. Um, but it's not just about um, engaging women and girls. So um, Helen, if I could have the next slide, please. So one of the first things that I just wanted to talk about was a little bit about us as a club. Um, we have only we're going to be five uh, in February, so we, we are literally a very young club and the slide you, you have in front of you just gives you an outline of, of what we call our state of the nation. Now, this is, these are the figures that we uh, we have from 2019, 2020. Um, and you can see that that that's broken down. The, the key point is that in 1920, we were at 58% uh, male uh, participant and 42% female. Um, the graph um, above the uh, uh, in the top right hand corner will show you how we've grown and the drop sessions are sections are where 
our membership uh, year ends. Uh, so we, we, as everyone does, usually use, lose a few members then. And again, when the AGB uh, renewal comes in, so that's where those those drops come come in, and then we 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 build up. What I'd, uh, I'm not going to go into the detail of, of this, um, but I am would like to just say that having a look at our figures for um, last year, that actually now we're even more evenly balanced in terms of our gender split. So um, up to 50, we are literally at a 50-50 split between um, male and female archers. Uh, and it's only above that 50 um, years old um, age group that it then starts to split and we have more gentlemen than, than than lady archers with us so if i have the next slide please okay philip philip's going to take you through this next bit uh yeah so i'll talk you through this one um what we can see there is um a, a stylized <laughs> journey of somebody uh into archery we're not going to spend an awful lot of time looking at the awareness side of of things um there's a huge amount of work has been done and can be done um, on making uh, women and girls more aware that archery is a sport for them. What we're going to focus on in, uh, in this talk is uh, about what happens once somebody takes that first step and decides that they, they want to get involved in the sport. I'm going to spend a little bit of time just looking at each of, um, each of these topics. So if you want to just whiz forward for me. So when awareness turns into interest, the, the likelihood is that, that people are going to um, uh, uh, fire up Google and take a little look at where their nearest archery club might be. And this is a snapshot from our front page of our, of our club website. Um, and it's, we believe it's really important that this window into your club uh, subconsciously and deliberately explains your club's ethos. So we are very much a gender balanced club um, right across the board in all aspects of, 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 of the club, both in members and coaches and operation. So we can see we've got a young, a young lady as part of our, uh, an earlier beginners course. We run events as well. You can see there's loads of folks from all shapes and sizes and ages enjoying events. Club, again, we've got there's a left-handed compound archer, we've got um, uh, lady recurves, and uh, on the right-hand side, obviously it's a picture of Paula, the, the subconscious um, idea there is, well, there's, a, there's somebody there, as it happens, it, it, she is a, a female coach, but there's somebody there who's coaching who, who, is a, who is a female that I could potentially identify with. So don't underestimate the power of of drawing people in using your website as your kind of advertisement. Okay, next slide. So on our website, we've put up uh, details about all our coaches. Obviously, this is uh, is my profile um, for those those who know me. Uh, we we thought it was really important to have a little bit more information about not just the coach's qualification but also a little bit about their background um uh, in addition to working full time i'm also a fully trained uh, sports massage therapist uh, and for some people actually knowing that can help unlock um, any barriers they might think well if I go to the, the, the beginners course and I've, I've got this problem with my shoulder and I'm, I'm not certain I'm going to be able to do it. If, if that coach is there, they may then be able to to help me out and, and, and actually take me through the beginners course. So what we've, we've done is we've tried to put a little bit of, of, of kind of, of ourselves out there on the website so that anyone that's looking in thinks, um, well, you know, there's somebody I might be able to go to if there is a barrier or something that that's blocking me from from actually coming into the uh, into into the beginners course and into the sport. Next slide, please. OK, this one's got a bit of a build on. So if you just want to tap the space bar and we'll just do a bit of a build. Th this bit, the induction into the sport. So somebody's done their beginners course. We make sure that we have a good split of male and female coaches on our courses. Um, um, partly because we want to spread the love, um, um, we, we tend to have to beat our coaches off with a with a, a stick because they all want to get involved in in helping to run beginners courses. 
but it's also important that we show the gender balance within the club, within the coaches that are, that are um, helping on the courses. But the next bit is vital, and, and you'll often hear um, anecdotal evidence from people that, well, I did my beginners course and then I joined the club and that was the last time I saw a coach and I was kind of left to flounder. And that's true of all genders. And I suspect, and some of the, um, the earlier speakers have, have expressed the, the, the concern that um, not having help and support and guidance when they first join a club is a real barrier to retention. So we've got, this is part some um, bits from our, um, uh, our, begin, our um, club booklet. So we just wanna hit it again. There we go. So these are some of the questions that people might want to ask, but either they forget on the beginners course or they feel foolish asking what they see, they think is a, uh, a silly question. We, we all constantly tell them there's no such thing as silly questions, just silly answers from the coaches. But it's some of the fundamental stuff that helps um, engage and in inform people and help them understand where they fit in in the scheme of things and, and some of the things that they might want to know before they turn up for their first club session. We also encourage people to actually just come down to our club sessions. Obviously in COVID times, that's not, not so not so easy. So we want to hit the, uh, the build again. Uh, and there's a bit more about some of the club admin, bits about um, about um, how we how we run our, our shooting days and things like that. But it just helps take some of the stress and and um, uh, and uh, uh, fear out of um, leaving the, the beginners course environment and coming join you know, the, the main club. Okay, so we move on. Oh yeah, and um, obviously access to coaching. We've got uh, something like 11 coaches and we're about, we're again a 50-50 split pretty much. So we've got um, uh, six male and five female coaches. And we've got um, two thirds of all of the female county coaches in the county. Uh, okay, let's move on. So we're gonna skip through these ones. Um, when we get to retention, we're really keen that people have a pathway, whether that's personal growth. And when we when we talk to, to people, often they'll say, um, well, what do you want to get out of, your, out of your archery? Well, I just want to get better. But they can't articulate what better means. So we provide them with a bit of a framework. Um, and for some, this is all they'll really ever want to get out of their sport is they'll want to come down to club shoot arrows and feel like they're progressing however they want to articulate progressing we're big uh, believers in world archery's um, progression scheme so we use that both with juniors and seniors and often what will happen is that people won't actually finish the world archery scheme and they'll move on to agb classifications before they ever finish the world archery bad scheme we'll find people will go back because they're badge monkeys and they'll go back and they'll retrofit the uh, the world archery badges so they can stick them on their quiver and have a big yeah loads of badges on the quiver um but we also make big use of both boost archery we host at cambridge's archery training center um, and because we're coaches and it's a club that's run by coaches predominantly that understandably we believe a lot in coaching so a lot of what we do is is um um, intermeshed with with coaching but coaching isn't everything so if we whiz through next slide we also signpost some of the other pathways that might exist uh, that they may be interested in so um, obviously we'll encourage people to take a coaching pathway if, if they they show some aptitude but obviously there's the judging pathway they may we're a performance um, specialist club um, we've got um, the 2019 uh, gold medalist uh, Jess Sargu, silver medal this year. Um, we've also got youngsters that are on the pathway. Um, so whatever people want to get out of the sport, we're there to help support them th along their journey, whatever that turns out to be. But equally, and, and we believe far more importantly, is what's on the next slide, which Paul is going to talk about. 
<clears throat> belonging. Uh, it's absolutely key at our club from the second the uh, uh, perspective Archer walks through the door to start their beginners course. We want them to make sure that they feel part of Peacock Archers. Um, and we, we work with all the coaches. We have quite a significant number of coaches who will spend time with the archers, making them feel part of our community on their beginners course. And, and then they, they take the big step to, to coming up to the club. And this is where we want them to join um, the, the, the purple T-shirt brigade or the purple army, as, as, as we nickname ourselves, uh, to, to actually feel that they are part of a team and everyone's part of that team to the extent they wish to be involved. So what we've done on this slide is we just grabbed some photos off of our, our website. Um, as I said at the start of the presentation, we're quite a young club. We've only been going sort of five years. But from this, somebody should be able to see something that fits in with their view of how they want to proceed with their archery. The photos in terms of diversity, you will see we're, we're, we're mixed, we're, we're male, we're female, we're adult, we're, we're junior, we are all shapes and sizes. And the advantage that we have is that this isn't just artwork on our website. This is what you'll actually see when you when you come down to the club. And that's that's really important, um, being able to actually support that image in reality. So it's not just we we are a performance um, based club and you can see from the photos that we've got um uh, medal winning um uh, photos we've got competitions but we also are about having fun um we have um family groups that come in uh, we've got photos here that show um, mother and son um for, uh, young children um coming in shooting sort of as part of a family group but we're also so picking up on that social aspect as well for our, our social archers. So yes, we are a performance club and some archers will come down and they'll shoot a few ends, but then they might take a few ends off and go and chat to other people. And actually having that ability to step in and step out of a session actually can help people with their sense of belonging. Um, we had an uh, uh, we have a, an archer who is currently retraining to become a teacher uh, in these COVID times, and uh, she came down in the summer and she she booked herself a slot to shoot. She put her bow together and she came up to to me and she said, "I don't really want to shoot today. I just need to talk to people." And that's what she did for that session. She just walked amongst the archers, socially distanced, of course, and we just chatted and we talked about archery and anything else. Um, and she went away feeling far more positive. Um, I know because I checked in with her um, afterwards to make sure that she was OK. Um, so we do have um, a purple army. We also have our archery mums who are fabulous for putting on sun cream at competitions. And at competition, so um, the f picture of Philip in the hat there, that was taken at a competition. And at lunchtime, we have a tendency, because we really try to foster this sense of belonging, we're all sat there eating our lunch together. We will kind of cluster in, in the largest space possible and sit and have our lunch together co cohesively as a group and then just go off as and, as and when we need to. So it's about developing the fun with the sport and the sense that you belong, even if it's just because you're wearing a purple T-shirt and you don't want to be part of part of the uh, the the competition or the action. So uh, next slide, please, Helen. Okay. Sorry, I get so enthusiastic about this stuff that I just keep talking for ages. So All right. just into the last couple of minutes now, then. There we go. OK, so these slides actually won't take very long because uh, um, Gail uh, has covered quite a lot of, of, of this already. Um, we, we know um, our location is just outside um, Cambridge so that we know that um, transport is actually a barrier, particularly for, for anyone with family. Um, getting onto that um, family uh, responsibility section, it's not just about children, it's about elderly parents. And, and we as a sport are perfectly located to be able to be flexible enough to, to deal with whatever is, is going on in, in uh, people's lives. Um, one of the key things that, that 
often isn't talked about um, and is a can be a particular um, barrier to women are the facilities and, and in particular toilets. Um, for, for gents, if you're shooting outdoors and there's no access to facilities, particularly in, a, in these COVID times, um, blokes you have it easy they can they can find a bush and and not having access to a toilet can actually be an enormous barrier for for female archers um there are times when when we need that that ability to uh, to, uh, to to go somewhere private um and then time well that that is a barrier to everyone that um particularly uh, at these times but getting back to what i was talking about about that sense of belonging um some people think that oh i've got to turn up to every session and 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 just trying to say that look even if you only come once every two months that's fine it's it's what fits for you so that you remove that that barrier and there's no there's no expectation and normally if somebody has been away we we will welcome with back with open arms i hope you're okay how's it going you know come and come and have some fun with your shooting um next next one please helen um the emotional barriers We've we've already covered um, most most of these. Uh, when when Helen and, and I were talking um, just prior to, uh, to to coming coming to this presentation, one of the things that we were were talking about was um, coaching and having female coaches on a beginners course. Uh, one of the issues that women have that's often not spoken about particularly if um, they are quite well endowed is the issue with string contact now male and female coaches can can deal with that but for some women knowing that there's going to be a woman on the course who is a coach and can understand their issues around dealing with with string contact actually can can help take an yet another emotional barrier out of the way so that they can move on and come and come and join our fabulous sport um, next slide please helen okay so this is our, our our kind of final thoughts we've talked a lot and quite generally but under the title of engaging women and girls and for us as a club We've achieved a kind of 50-50 split on, on gender, not by actively going out and targeting any particular group, be it gender, ethnic minority, um, any of, the, any of the, the target groups. We do that by treating them as people and also in a personal manner. So we try to match our engagement with them by how they would like to be engaged with so yes some people are full of fun some people like it a little bit quiet some people just just want to go out there and do and they're really competitive and we try and match our our response to them as coaches to to what they're looking for in the in the shooting environment and it's also really about how we would like to be treated as well so we would like to be treated with respect with courtesy and to feel listened to so we we really take those values and we really try and um, encourage not only our other coaches but our club members to join that ethos um, to give everyone the support that they need to to, to come into the club and then stay with us and um, philip's just going to finish on the final final bit here um, so oh, just back up one file very quickly. <clears throat> so um, th there's there's the 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 old saying. I'm, I'm sure many of you have been on management courses will know about proper preparation prevents poor performance. But it's a bit trite, but it's true. You can't ever under prepare for um, for any part of the process of um, uh, of working with with your members whether they are prospective members new members or members that have been with you for since since the word go um we make lists we're terrible list makers well i say terrible list makers i'm a terrible list maker um but we make lots of lists there's nothing nothing bad about making lists and there's no no mistake in the file right at the head of the presentation where the induction bit was a, a checklist because sometimes you can simply forget something really important, like perhaps 
um, checking in with a new member every time you see them at club just to make sure everything's okay and they're, they've got a friendly face that they can work to. I know a lot of people have talked about mentoring systems. Um, and professionalism, just because the vast majority of us out there are, are, are amateurs, we're not getting paid for it, it doesn't mean that we can't apply a professional view on things. And I think that comes across in the, the relationships that you have with, with new members and existing members that you know, we may be amateur, but act in a professional manner. Uh, and we just want to finish up with a few resources that uh, we found that, that you guys might find, uh, you folks might find uh, useful. That's really great. Thank you both to uh, Paula and Philip and great to have you uh, as part of the discussion that will be coming up later as well. So thank you very much for your preparation. And now I'm just going to um, also invite Lydia onto microphone just to share with us uh, a few of your experiences, Lydia, uh, to maybe explain to us about Flamestrike Archery and what your values are there. So welcome, Lydia. Hi, thanks for picking Hello. the awesome picture, Helen. Love That's, it. Uh, you're welcome, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm Lydia, I'm one of the coaches at Stratford Archers. And uh, last year I'd actually um, started my own business. I started up Flamestrike Archery and I had the intention of targeting a specific group um, in particular um, that was very important to me. And I'll give you a bit of background to that. So I have three children and my eldest daughter, um, this came up probably about last year, so she would have been eight. Um, she'd been struggling for quite a while now, uh, mainly with social exclusion from her peers. And um, I think if you're a mother, you'd kind of really relate to, you know, wanting to help your help your child feel included. And um, so I had uh, I had really strong motivation to want to work with kids in building up um, relationships and confidence about themselves. And this probably also relates back to kind of when I was a child um, growing up, I think. I kind of grew up in that setting where I was kind of one of the boys until one day I suddenly wasn't. Um, and then I spent a good deal of my teenage years in that whole flux, as we all do, as teens, kind of wondering, what am I? Who am I? Where am I going? What's my whole life calling and purpose about? Um, but I think in my case, it had ended up kind of spiraling down towards um, a pathway of depression um, really low self-confidence and eventually this led to things like body image issues where in my like early 20s I was dealing with um, eating disorders and so I kind of reflected on my own background and seeing my child now displaying all those types of behaviors at eight kind of was like well is this this must be a norm then and I think the more that I read into it I was realizing um, that teens in this particular age group of girls really needed role modeling and really needed that boost in self-confidence. So um, my main focus then turned with Flamestrike into uh, building up confidence and positivity. So I guess I'll throw out a couple of stats here as to why this mean this group has been a target for me. So I think it kind of ties in with Gail's numbers that she was saying. But even more so, I think with the teenage years between the ages of 11 to 16, you'll see, uh, sorry, this is based on Youth Sports Trust, um, their survey done in 2017 and their Girls Active survey. And only 8% of girls in that age group met uh, physical um, activity requirements set out by the uh, chief medical officer. So that's... Uh, I guess, in comparison with boys in that same age group, which isn't a really great big difference, they were about 16%, but it was half, half of the girls in that age group were actually physically active. So a lot of the similar barriers exist in that age group as well, too, where there's a big dissatisfaction with body image, especially with girls. Um, and 11 to 14 year old girls being extremely unhappy with their body image. And this increases to one in three girls uh, by the time they reach 14 to 16 years. So not only is confidence and self-consciousness an issue, but they don't like being watched. 
they don't like being watched particularly by boys. Um, they're very self-conscious of it. And um, with a whole bunch of other like um, kind of barriers as well, including not liking the types of activities that are on offer. Um, and also a factor from home being that girls were less encouraged by parents to be um, active. So with all of these barriers in place then, my main focus with Flame Strike has been to uh, to build up confidence. And I've been doing that mainly through uh, community, community growth and opening up conversations. And that means being very open and honest about my own personal journey and how that's taken me and where that's taken me. And once you show that you're kind of relatable, uh, then you can switch to then showing how how I've been able to change my mindset. How did I move from you know 20 year olds overweight and bulimic to where I am now? You know it was not a certain overnight journey. It took a lot of support. It took a lot of community work. It you know not community work but work you know relying on the community around you and recognizing that you're not alone. And I think that was um, that was a big focus for me then. Um, so uh, how do I do that? I guess in my sessions then, I think this year especially has been um, because of the lack of ability to be able to deliver any courses, has been um, working with people in goal setting. And I think that part ha helps to incorporate then not just your archery goals and development, but having integrally as part of that set like goal process to include mindset growth exercises, uh, which integrate mindfulness as well, too. And it's about building that inner confidence and showing that. And I know that this probably takes an extra step outside of the coaching aspect, which is, you know, that technical side um, and that growth and progression. But I think once you make those connections as a person um, and you show that that community is there to support you these uh these people come out feeling um feeling better about themselves and then wanting to share that with others so then you're already developing that mentor community so hope that gives you a bit of insight as to how how i do things that was great thank you lydia yeah thank you very much for sharing and and also for sharing kind of your own personal journey and um, we've got such a wealth of experience on the call this evening so that's really lovely. So just to summarise, um, we've heard from all our speakers now. Um, just before we go into a discussion, um, we wanted to just highlight seven key points, uh, suggestions of things you might remember when thinking about uh, planning and delivering sport that particularly engages women and girls. So um, think about the offer that you are that you are actually putting together. Um, you've got to kind of think proactively about the women you're targeting rather than expecting women to change to fit in with um, the sport that you're offering. Language, uh, you might not uh, choose to just talk about sport. For many women, the word sport has baggage, but um, what about their goals? What about getting them active? What about uh, their enjoyment? And how can you differentiate archery from other interests by promoting the additional benefits? So what is your audience looking for? Seeing is believing. That point's been made really firmly this evening. So can someone see someone like them or someone, even if they're not like them, someone that they can relate to, someone that perhaps inspires them? Um, so someone of all ages, someone perhaps of all sizes, faiths, not just being active, but it's celebrating it and encouraging others to join in. And then the use of positivity and encouragement to drive action. Um, talking about the consequences of not doing something is, is really not as uh, effective as that positivity and encouragement option. How can you make it easy for women and girls? How can you offer them the right time? Thinking about those time constraints we were talking about earlier, the right place, the right welcome, the right company, talking about grouping women together if possible, and the right gear. Um, uh, people make or break the experience. So just to uh, remake that point again, that, you know, if you can really try and ensure your archers are appropriately supported along the way. So understanding their needs, 
and providing for them. And if you want to do some more uh, research, um, you can look up yourself on the Sport England site. There's lots of information out there available to you. So if we were to track a member's journey, a typical member's journey um, into archery and then through archery, um, if you if your club was to come up against, um, if you, your club was to meet someone like Serena, um, how would your club recruit Serena? How would you communicate to Serena? And what does she need to know about your club? What club activities can Serena take part in and how will you tell her about those? And obviously Serena is a junior at this point, uh, given this example on the slide, so it could be involving her whole family in that. But it could be someone older that you might like to think of as well. How would you communicate? How do you know which sessions are going to match their needs? And how does the archer provide you feedback on that? If they did have an issue, how would you get to know about that? And what will retain an archer at your club? So if we're thinking about our next steps, um, what, are, what would the female members in your club say? So could you consult with your female members in your club? What would it make it what would make it easier for them to invite women that they know? Um, is it a, a good opportunity to discuss this topic with the wider club? Um, you might want to do a club evaluation. You know, what is our welcome like? What is our image like? What are our coaching opportunities like? What are our role modelling opportunities like? How do we support people? What are the key ideas you want to take away? Um, on target, um, there isn't a specialism particularly about women and girls, but women and girls is embedded across all of the specialisms. So if you are part of the on target club uh, programme, then um, what are your next values? What, are, what is your um, development plan saying about women and girls in particular? Do you want it to have some goals on there to help you better addra uh, address the balance in your club? Um, have you got, do you hold a specialism or is it time to renew your specialism? Have you checked on your on target status recently? It may well need renewing because as Gail said earlier, we've sort of lost a year. And um, so that might be a great opportunity for you if you wanted to make some changes to say, well, let's build it into our on target plan or our specialisms. And then um, could you run a women and girls only session? It could just be a one beginners course to pilot that, see how that goes, take feedback, review, or it could be that you want to build that in as a regular uh, women only or girls only session in the club. How would you go about that? And then uh, I think Gail might want to talk at this point about recruiting volunteers. Yeah, um, obviously all of this activity relies heavily on, on volunteers. So if your club was struggling for volunteers, we have got a volunteer campaign at the moment where we've got um, contact details for 269 volunteers that are really happy to try and support local clubs. So if volunteers is an issue for you, then um, please get in contact and we can see if we can match you with any available workforce. And then I think um, we also had the opportunity there of Project Ramaya looking to expand. Yeah, so um, if anyone has, um, yeah, comes from a sort of a diverse uh, community and you're interested in Project Ramaya then we would love to, to work with you so yeah again please get in touch. Okay and um, uh, some of you may be aware that Sport England have just confirmed their strategy for the next 10 years um, and women and girls are still a really key priority so if you're building into that area that may well stand you in really good stead in terms of uh, fitting in with the overall uh, direction of development um, and I appreciate again that not everyone on this call is in England but just to make you aware of that value going forward. So um, already been pointed out to you that there are places to go to uh, for support so we just wanted to give you those websites uh, for women in sport, This Girl Can and for the Sport England Club Matters website which again I know not all of you live in England but it's a website that's open to anyone clicking on that so and they're really good facilities uh, there to help you think through your 
approach to women and girls, but also information that will really help you. So starting our discussion uh, section of the evening, um, really encourage you uh, to either use the chat box or to to maybe raise a hand or come off uh, come off mute onto microphone and and share some ideas if you've got an idea or a question or a point that you want to make. You know what what do you think? To some of the points that you've made this e that you've heard made this evening, and in particular thinking about your club. You know what is the male and female mix like, um, or what what is the welcome like for female archers or potential female archers at your club um, and why might that be so we're just going to open a kind of wider discussion now um, and there are some questions that I'm just going to kind of leave up on screen for us to base our discussion around but it doesn't have to be on one of these points that you uh, you want to uh, come off mic and maybe raise a point so let me pop these all up on screen and take give you a minute or two just to read through. So we're going to uh, uh, just invite you now to um, have a think about whether you want to come off microphone. And um, if there have been any points raised whilst we've been going through the presentations. Gail, I don't know if you've picked up on any uh, questions or points that people might want to make now. Uh, no, there's been lots of activity going on on the, the chat box, but no sort of specific questions. So I know that there are some people on the call this evening that I've kind of um, invited along particularly because I know that you're heavily involved or you may hold a role. Um, I know there's some judges on the call and etc. So if anybody wants to hop on and tell us about something that they've learned along the way, then you'd be very, very welcome to do that. Graham, uh, you've got a, your hand, hand raised. Graham, do you want to come on onto microphone? Hi, yeah, I don't know if you can hear me because I've been having problems with this tonight. Yeah, we can. All right, great. Uh, it's quite funny, actually, because if I actually look at our old club um, title, it is quite gender definitive. In as much as it's called AC Delco Bowman Archery Club, which is not very inclusive when you think about it. So thinking about what's been going on tonight, I think we need to change it. That's an interesting point. Now, does anyone else have an experience of maybe changing their club title or particularly choosing a title because of gender issues? The other point I mentioned, and I actually mentioned it, and I think Ben replied to my comments, is that I've noticed that through the presentations that the the main point that seems to be occurring is that the newer clubs that are newly established within the last five or six, seven years seem to be more aware of how to approach female membership as opposed to the old, more established clubs. And as I said, I have a funny feeling that that could have been a problem within our own club because obviously it is uh, a mainly male dominated sport in the past and it's not really been inclusive and I think that has to change. Yeah that's a great point thank you very much Graham. Does anyone else want to pick up on on that point or other points? And what's your um what is it what is the gender split like at your clubs? Does anyone have a uh, comment on that. Have you managed to get many female coaches? Mandy, do you want to uh, come on microphone? Yes, um, I found it very interesting listening to everybody um, this evening. So thank you everyone that's been um, presenting on this. Um, as you know, we are a young club and as the gentleman has just said, you know, there does appear to be something in the newer clubs 
probably have a bit more of a um, informed um, history regarding um, getting women and young girls into the sport. I mean, we're about 60-40. We're about 60 male, 40% women. All our coaches are female. Um, the chair of the club is female. The secretary is female. Safeguarding officer is female. The treasurer is male. Work party are male. So you can see there that straight away there's sort of like a gender <laughs> going where the guys want to do the manual work, whereas it was females want to be in charge and do the paperwork. Um, for me, though, going back about what some of the um, comments have been regarding the older clubs and the name changes, I do think we need to be aware that we could potentially get into a, a situation where we start changing things because it's deemed the right thing to do in society. Um, I think there's nothing personally for everybody who's on this site. I'm female. I'm a lesbian. I'm not a man hater. I love men. I think they're wonderful creatures and they have their uses. And I mean that tongue in cheek. But I don't think there's anything wrong with a club being called Bowman. The same as I don't think there's anything wrong with a female led title. And I'd, I'd hate to think that with lots of clubs now that are Bowman go around thinking that they need to change their name to be able to, you know, sort of like be more confident with the gender situation of male and females in the sport because every sport that you, you do there is a divide in female and male because males are generally the stronger in physical presence and they're deemed to be you know the one that can shoot shoot more poundage they can run quicker they can do this and that's what society we are in here, though, it is about the fact that in a sport that is a minority sport, we want to attract more females, whether that be 80 year old female or an eight year old female. And I think that's where we just need to be aware of where this conversation could potentially go, because no matter who you are, whether you're a lovely fella that's on this um, call or a very strong, independent female, the one thing we all have is we want archery to be very much suitable for both parties. So whether it's male or female, and this is just an area now where females potentially could get into the sport. And I think, like you say, with peacock archers, they obviously have a great format. It's very friendly. I've looked at their website. And by the way, purple is my favourite colour. So I think I need to come and join your club too. <laughs> But for me, it is a case of, you know, it's a great topic that we're discussing. And I do think we're all aware that, yes, there are more men in the sport than women. That is just a fact. And how we now can go about attracting more women and young girls, the same way as ethnic minorities, how can we attract them? The same as disabled individuals, male and female, how can we attract them in within our sport? So that was for me was just to say, you know, let's let's be aware of, you know, we don't suddenly want names changing and it's not a case of negative about men at all. We all just want to have more archers in and if we can get more females in, fantastic. And I think we're on to a good one here with all of us on this workshop. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's the focus for this evening. And what is it that we can do? Um to attract more women and girls in. Yeah, so thank you, Mandy. That's good uh, balance. So Katie, uh, Katie, you've got your hand raised as well. Do you want to pop on to the microphone? Thanks. Yeah, um, just to introduce myself, I know some of you know me. My name's Katie Lipscomb. I'm an international judge. Um, I am also the judge liaison officer for SCAS, vice president of SCAS, and uh, venue inspector for AGB. Um, I just firstly want to big up judging. Uh, I don't know how many of you know, but in the UK, we have three international judges, two of which are female, and one of which will be the chair of judges at the Olympics in Tokyo this summer. So hopefully that demonstrates that judging is um, accessible to everyone. Um, I think judging does appeal to quite a lot of uh, women because it is 
completely gender neutral, uh, even though we do use the title chairman, and I, I won't apologise for that. Um, but uh, it gives you a chance to do the social side of the sport a lot more um, and have more human interaction with the other archers, which I think appeals to quite a few ladies. Uh, we also find we get a lot of younger women wanting to become judges. Um, because I know when I started, it was a way of being involved in the sport when you're kind of at those sort of awkward teenage years, later teenage years, um, and you're not overly confident in being out there and competing. So it gives you a chance to be involved and still mix with everybody. Uh, judging wise, we have actually implemented um, some changes to try and assist uh, all judges, but hopefully it will be of more benefit to women. For example, we've introduced a sabbatical that so if you need to take some time off for, you know, six months, a year, whatever, uh, due to work, childcare, maternity leave, whatever, that's accessible to you. It's not a question of have a family and you're out of the sport. Um, so, yeah, within judging, we do try to maintain a, a good gender balance. The thing I have noticed is, though, the higher you get up the sport uh, in my role in the SCAS committee, the more male it becomes. I'm the only woman on the SCAS executive. I quite often sit in SCAS meetings and in AGB meetings, and I look around the room and there's only one or two women. So maybe that's something AGB could do is promote more visually and vocally the women that hold high positions within that side of the uh, the sport to give women something to aim for. Absolutely. Yeah, you rock, Katie. We're bigging you up. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you for, for coming on, on and you make some really good points. Yeah. Um, Thank you. There's there's someone called Aaron on the phone. Uh, oh. Does Aaron want to come on microphone? No. Can you hear me? He doesn't, Hello. He doesn't. He's had his chance, everybody, didn't he? I definitely invited him in. I'm here. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yes. Uh, well, good evening, everybody, and uh, and uh, yeah, it's really good to sit here and, and listen to the discussions that have been taking place. The uh, uh, presenters have been uh, fantastic tonight, so thank you, everybody, that's uh, been taking part in that. Okay, <laughs> yeah, that was very short and sweet. <laughs> Sorry, my, my my screen froze. I didn't know whether you could still hear me. Apologies. Okay. What yeah. the the question I was getting to is just building on what Mandy said, and uh, and Katie also um, uh, referenced it towards the end. Is as a governing body, do do we aim for fifty fifty split, or do we do we take that lead, or do we say we're going to make the sport the best it can be for everybody that wants to come in. OK, I'm sure lots of people have the some thoughts it can on that. be for everybody who wants to come in. Thank you, Mandy. Susan, uh, you've also had your hand raised. Um, Mandy, feel free to chip, chip in again if you want to later, but I want to bring Susan in. Yeah, so um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a highly competitive archer. I compete for Great Britain and it's been really interesting to hear everyone that's spoken tonight and all of the things that um, that different clubs have kind of done to attract females into the sport. And um, Philip, obviously, I know your club really well. And what you guys have done is you've built a club which has lots of people that are people like other people. So I could come up, I could come to your club and I could find someone like me who is a highly competitive person who wants to compete for the country. My mum could rock up to your club because she wants actually just wants to come and meet a couple of people and have a coffee. So it's really easy for someone to come to your club, find someone like them, they're engaged, they're going to keep coming back. Whereas if you come into my club, I'm the only competitive female archer full stop in the club let alone female archer 
usually I'm the only female in the session. However, that doesn't bother me because what's important to me is that I can rock up and I can have access to the facilities that I need in order to better my archery. So I guess the point I'm coming to is that we just need to be aware that everybody's needs are different, no matter what their gender is. And we have to recognise what people need from us as clubs and try and fulfil that. So to go to Aaron's question, which was, where do we take this to? And I, I don't think that we should be aiming for a, we're going to have a 50-50 split because one, I think it's really ambitious. I'm not aware of another sport that has that, um, although I've not dug into the numbers. But I think we do need to recognise everybody's needs as they come into our door and try and fulfil that need that they have so that they keep coming back. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And it's about kind of how do we give people a voice that perhaps aren't having their needs met? And that's why they're not coming back to the to the club or how how can we um, learn from why people perhaps left the clubs our clubs um who is it that we're not tapping into at the moment and are, are we missing anything there but also yeah how do we support those that we have in our clubs um philip uh you've also had your hand raised so over to philip uh yeah uh, so um, one of the other things that I'd, I'd like to kind of underline and, and stress is I'm absolutely not against specific projects to to try and engage any particular group. That's fantastic. What I would um, absolutely stress is have a plan for how you're going to bring those people on board and keep them. Otherwise, all you're doomed to do is just run outreach projects for particular groups. And you'll bring people in, they'll stay for six months and then they'll leave again. Um, I think, think Mary pointed out a bit earlier, it's far easier to keep the members you've got than try and find new ones. So um, projects to find, uh, find archers, brilliant. That's how we grow the sport. But we only grow it if we keep the ones we've got. So, um, um, it, it, the takeaway, I think, from Paul and I's presentation is plan and have a plan for keeping for, for all aspects of it, for, for uh, introduction, for induction and for retention. Have a plan for everything. Thank you, Philip. Yeah, that's really good. Um, has anybody got any uh, ideas that they perhaps are going to walk away with this evening that they want to implement? Uh, you might want to have a think about that as well. It's easy to do a lot of listening. There's been a lot of information shared, but are there one or two takeaways that you've got from this evening's session that you want to focus in on or talk to someone else about in the club? Um, Nikki, do you want to uh, come off mute and uh, come on microphone? Hi, yeah, it's Nikki Hunt here. Can you hear me? We can, yeah. Welcome, Nikki. Hi, yeah. I was just thinking... Um, you know, to really try and engage particularly women, um, a, an idea would be perhaps to link with those specific groups in the community. So whether that was, you know, even approaching a women's institution group to do link up and do once a month, they come and do archery at your club or um, the girl guides, for example, having those links with other very specific women's groups in the community. And I think if you had a session which ran once a week or once a month, then that would be something which would probably be ongoing and you might find some of those people want to come across and join the club and be active members but others it might just be that once a month contact which you know they enjoy that but their primary focus is their normal club they come and you know try archery every so often so there's some different ideas about you know specifically targeting those groups I think Tim Swain's on the group tonight and he's mentioned to me before about you know we could open up to um, for example, uh, women and baby group groups and advertise that in the community. They come, you know, at Bowbrook, we've got a lovely facility. We've got our own indoor facility where they could come on a Tuesday at 11 o'clock, you know, and have that time specifically for them. So there's lots of ideas, I think, out there which we could engage women better. Um, but equally, agreeing with what Susan said, for me personally, it wasn't about 
who else was there. I was a very competitive archer. For me, that didn't really matter. Um, but it's really if you want to try and engage a different group of people into the sport. Um, and, you know, with what Aaron said around, um, you know, do we want to become 50-50? Is that the most important thing? I would probably say no, it's probably not the most important thing. I think trying to make the sport the best we can be as a sport is more important. Um, understanding why we lose our members is really important, um, you know, and carrying on that research as well. So, yeah, it's great to hear from everyone tonight. It's really enjoyed the discussion. So thanks, everyone. Thanks, Nikki. Yeah, that's really good. Good input there. Some some people really uh, picking up your points there about guides. And uh, Mandy, um, your hand is raised as well. Over to you. Cool, thank you. Um, I forgot what I was going to say now. Oh, um, hang on, she'll come back to me in a minute. I'm having a senior moment. <laughs> Don't worry, we can come back to you. That's fine. Lydia, do you want to hop in and then we can go back to Mandy? Oh, I just uh, need to just unmute there, Lydia, and then it's over to you. <laughs> Sorry, there's always somebody that needs to be talk told like you're on mute. No worries. Um, uh, I was just going to say I really appreciated that uh, that bit with um, where Philip was talking about the importance of the image that you put out and the information that you put out um, for the general community to be able to reach you. You know, so having that website information, but mainly also like just having a social media presence in this day and age, I think is key as well too. And that is absolutely where I've grown my community. Um, that's a big focus for me. Um, I know that my target group is there. I know that um, there are parents out there with girls that are struggling with the same things that my daughter ha has and is. Um, so I know, I know I'm very focused into where they are and how to reach them. And I think if you've got as a club, uh, people who are, you know, social media kind of experts or just familiar with it, getting them involved and just saying, like, look, we need we need to grow that. I think is a good point. Uh, so thanks, Philip, for uh, for bringing that up. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Thanks, Lydia. Mandy, over to you. I remembered. Thanks, Greg, for that. Um, what it was was about the the ladies who have spoken who. Um, of coming from various um, backgrounds about being confident, they're competitive, they're doing their archery. It doesn't matter if they're, you know, if they were the only female on a beginner's course, um, etc. And I think that's absolutely brilliant because, you know, we are women on this course because we we are confident women, Not probably not all of us. But what we have to remember is that there are a lot of women and girls out there that do not have the confidence that us women on this meeting have. So even though your perspective could be, um, you know, I, I'm fine being a female and I can turn up to a beginner course that's got 10 guys on it and I'm not bothered. I'm not, it doesn't, it doesn't phase me in the slightest. But there are a lot of women out there who do lack confidence and probably are sat at home thinking, I'd quite like to go out and do archery but feel timid by it and intimidated by it. And it's us female role models on here who are confident to actually show them that they can do it. And it is something that they can join in um, because we probably all started off at some point in our lives where we weren't that confident with something that we were going to try and do for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, I know Lydia, obviously, her lifestyle, my lifestyle, as some of you probably know, has not been particularly brilliant. I've had my issues, but now you would never say I'm not a confident individual. But at one point, I would not have walked into a room full of people, never mind men. So, you know, it's all about our own personal journeys, isn't it? But it's also being aware that there are a hell of a lot of women out there who probably do want to do archery, but are actually lacking the confidence to turn up. So it's how, like Philip and um, Paula, how do we offer that for them? What can we do for them to see, you know, that women can do this and we are friendly and our guys are friendly and helpful and everything else. See, I did remember it in the end, even though I had a senior moment. Thank you. Yeah, that's good. Thank you, Mandy. It's a really good point. Very well made there. Yeah. And um, 
there are a couple of people on this evening and I don't want to put people on the spot at all <laughs> because uh, as we've noticed, uh, you know, uh, not everyone wants to speak up in a group of people they don't know so well. But um, I wondered if uh, anyone wanted to add any further points on uh, the call. I know uh, Paula, I didn't know whether we wanted to come back to you at all or um, to Sarah as well or to Caitlin. Um, so, yeah, if any of you do want to come on, then just hop on your microphones. You're yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to hop on because I um, am actually quite an introverted and, and shy person. So um, I, it was actually a conscious decision that I made when I when I reached a certain age milestone. Uh, and it, it was like, right, OK, I'm now going to go and do some things. I'm going to do one thing every year that, that, that scares me. I don't mean risky behaviour. What I'm talking about was something that's outside of my comfort zone. So um, the first year, I decided to go and get the start the sports massage qualification the following year my archery beginners course came up and it was just actually having to make that decision now that was a very personal one but I'm still shy and quite introvert so actually rocking up at the beginners course room full of people because there were about 30 people that were had rocked up um for the beginners course and yet I still felt nurtured I still felt safe and they gave me the confidence to to give this a go and to not be afraid to fail so it was it was actually an, and uh, you know I will embarrass them Philip and Mary were running that course and um, they they really really made made me feel very welcome and it, it's that it was that introduction that actually started my archery journey and I'm still here so it's, it's their fault you haven't got rid of me so. <laughs> Thanks, Paula. Yeah, it's great to hear a personal story. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Caitlin, um, would you like to come on microphone? Hi. Yeah, just again, building off that point, I wouldn't say I'm a particularly confident person by nature, but it's more that I've made a conscious decision to push myself to engage in the social aspect. And I think especially within regards to archery, just making little steps at a time and like going maybe speaking to a few people at a competition or just socializing within the club just doing it slowly and little by little and before you know it you've you're looking back on like how far you've come and being able to do that is quite dependent on the fact that it was I was lucky enough to be in a really sort of encouraging environment I had lots of support and so I want to expand that support to any others so for example when I'm at competition I'll just be friendly to people. If I see somebody who's perhaps struggling a bit, I'll go offer my support. Um, one of the things I do notice is quite a bit through like being involved with the archery club at my university is obviously a lot of people are coming into that sport for the first time and they have no experience about like, well, sport in general for some people, but for how archery works. And just the chance to slowly introduce them to the community, especially outside of the universities. So one of the things I've managed to do with the Newcastle University Archers is encourage them to attend and like seek opportunities in the external competitions as well as their uni league. And we were quite lucky that right before the COVID lockdown came in, we actually got uh, quite a few interested in the novice shoot and attended and I think as well another thing that we I'm lucky enough to be is that there's quite a few people in our club who will go along to competitions merely just to support people there and um, I've seen it both in the novice competitions and in like junior competitions there's usually people willing to go there just to support in that kind of capacity and just that constant sort of presence of encouragement but not like not overtly sort of like Oh, go on, do this. But just like that gentle background encouragement, I think has been a really key factor in both like making people feel like they can do it, but also making them enjoy it. And then as you're enjoying it, they're like, I want to keep doing this. And it makes obviously retention a whole lot better because there is more of a drive to I want to do this. I can do this. And it's just a slow process that gradually they're gaining both confidence and the sort of belief that this is for them. Mm -hmm. It's just something that I've sort of like found through pardon me, experiences. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, thank you, Caitlin. Yeah, 
it's so good to hear what everyone's been uh, involved in. So if you have welcomed people into archery or if you are role modelling in a particular role, if you um, have invited somebody along into archery or supported someone's journey, then thank you for what you're doing. And please do spread that. And um, if, whatever gender you are, thank you for supporting women and girls into the sport. Um, I popped into the chat box the link to the feedback survey. Uh, it's very quick. So before you log off tonight, don't want to um, miss anybody. You don't have to go yet, but I don't want to miss anybody. So just to encourage you to click onto that so that you can fill that out this evening while it's still fresh in your mind. Um, but also, if you do have suggestions about future Monday Natters webinars, then um, feel free if you want to drop one of those by me. Um, we do have another session on the 15th is the next Monday Natters session. Um, but there are also lots of other webinars that AGB are running at the moment. So feel free to sign up to webinars through the members portal um, or encourage someone else in your club to sign up to one you think might be relevant for them. If you see one that is more relevant for someone else, you know. I know there's been lots of really good points made in the chat um, and I definitely think being normal is underrated, Susan. So we don't want you normal, <laughs> but the, thank you. I haven't been able to catch everybody's comments in the chat, but I think it's been a really helpful session. Um, some of you may want to connect together. Um, that's what Monday Natters is all about as well. If you feel like you've met someone on one of these sessions and you want to open that discussion further, then I'd encourage you to do that if you can get in touch or if you want to send me a message that I then pass on to them, then feel free to use me as a go between. Um, but if you want to uh, make a further point, then feel free to pop up your hand and you can come onto microphone. But we'll probably begin to wind up our discussions there. Just that encouragement again to not leave the session this evening without scribbling down or making a mental note of things that you have heard that you want to put into action or at least start discussions about at your club if you've been inspired by something. Does anybody else want to uh, make any points? I just want to thank you, everybody that's come on to microphone this evening then, particularly for those that have prepared uh, presentations or prepared to share their experiences. And there's been personal experiences shared as well, which I really appreciate. And uh, I know that it can feel a little daunting for some. So thank you for everyone for their preparations. Uh, Mandy, just over to you then. Sorry, it's a question and this might be for anyone can answer this because we're at a time with COVID whereby, you know, sport is struggling. There's potentially a, a window for us as an opportunity to really show off the sport. But the thing that we all do is the beginner's course and the beginner's course is done via different ways over the clubs, be it a you know, weekend or several weeks of sessions. Is there anything that we can do to potentially shorten a beginner's course to be able to fast track people coming through more? And the reason I ask that is because we are a club that does not have our own venue. We don't have... Um, great things with time so we're very very strict with time a lot of our people you know are in the nursing community so they haven't got time to give support so for us to be able to get more women and females in who time is such a restriction for them because a lot of them are parents how can we potentially look at how we can lessen a beginner's course to be able to get more through the door I thought I'd put that out there. Yeah, are there uh, women only taster sessions you might want to offer as a club or um, Graham, do you want to come off mute? Yeah, that was that was an interesting comment from Mandy, actually, because it's something I've actually thought about with this COVID-19. Uh, with air coaching, with judging, I believe there is a certain amount of um, computer learning, particularly with the, I mean, particularly with the World Archery um, Coaching course. A lot of it is done through a particular session of 
computer module. Now, I'm not saying this is going to work, but perhaps if the safety aspect of and the, and the technical side of archery that we teach as a beginner uh, would be put onto a computer course and they're, they're assessed on their ability to absorb the safety aspects of archery. And then when they go along for perhaps two weekends, physically to do an assessment, perhaps that would reduce that time of going for four sessions on an archery field to gain their qualifications. They could do their, their practical examination, perhaps in two sessions, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, or one on a Saturday, one on a Sunday. That would reduce the coach's time, but also it would reduce the archery's time. I'm not saying it's going to work, but it's a possibility. Might be something to, uh, to continue to discuss. Uh, in the future or something for another webinar yep. or something to talk to your coaches about in your club and see what your club approach might be to that. Be interesting to see what the answers would come back as. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Graham. Yeah. OK, we're just um, going to thank you all for your attendance this evening. Um, we're going to leave it there for, for tonight, but I hope that's opened a discussion rather than closing it down. Um, and do feel free to, as I say, get in contact if you'd like to, if there are further points you want to make or questions you want to make. So good evening, everybody. Um, we'll say good night for that and uh, hope to see you again on another webinar soon. <laughs>